Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Alex Sotka. I'm with Feile, and I'm your host for this section. Um, so um, our next topic is Fire from Jupiter, presented by Lee, Gigi, and Nick. Uh, this session is a let's, let's build session. So it will be a bit more interactive. If you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask any questions. Uh, otherwise, you can also use the Hoover uh, question and answer section to uh, post your questions there. And we also have a chat available here directly in Zoom. And with that, I would say we get started. Uh, Lee, you're you also on mute. You need to. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll start sharing my screen here. All right, so hopefully you should see a GitHub repository on the screen. Um, so I've posted this link into the Whova chat and also the Zoom chat. You can use either one to ask us questions or interact with us. Um, also, we can unmute all the participants as needed. It looks like we don't have um, too large of a crowd. So I think everyone will have kind of some individual attention, which is great. And hopefully we can all kind of level up our skills and, and uh, play with these notebooks that we've established and presented yesterday. Uh, one thing I did want to get a feel for is how many of the attendees today were on our tutorial session yesterday. Um, so I'm trying to see, I, th I think there's like a raise hand option or perhaps just a, uh, uh, add response. So yeah, please raise your hand if you were on yesterday's session. And then I'll try to figure out how to how to see how many people have raised their hand. <laughs> All right, so we've got, I think, looks like we have quite a few people that maybe weren't on yesterday. Um, so, uh, so that's fine. Uh, uh, it just helps us to, to know kind of what you've seen and what you haven't seen. So um, uh, yesterday we went through these three notebooks. Um, the first one is covering the Fire REST API. Uh, so this is basically like learning about HL7 Fire search and all the different ways that you can search data that exists inside of a Fire server. Um, at the end of that notebook, we export the data into what's called bulk Fire format, which is um, uh, a way of capturing a lot of fire records inside of a single very large file. We then import that into a sep our second notebook, which uses Apache Spark to process those and then um, curates that into a nice uh, a clean data frame. And then our third notebook adds a predictive model on top of that. Um, so in today's Let's Build session, we're going to build on that tutorial and uh, you all are going to get hands-on with the notebooks that we provided. Uh, there's a couple ways to do that, um, but the one that we've kind of recommended and written up here is to use the IBM uh, IBM Cloud has a um, has a kind of free free tier for getting started, and um, it's the IBM Cloud Pack for data. And then within that, the thing we're going to be using is called IBM Watson Studio, and it gives us a Jupyter Notebook environment that has access to this to a Spark cluster behind this covers. So this is sort of the one of the easiest ways to get set up with a Jupyter Notebook environment that includes a Spark environment, which our second and third notebooks use. If you only intend to use the Fire API and explore the Fire API, then you're welcome to use a Jupyter Notebook, you know, and from a different hosting hosting provider, or just spin one up yourself. Um, we do not for that, but uh, we could probably assist you with that if that's the route you wanted to go. Um, for those that are following the steps we've written up, here's how you can get started with uh, registering. And so um, there's actually a really nice path here um, from the README. So if you can go to this link. This will get, take you to a page that looks like this. If you already have an IBM Cloud account, you can log in with it. If you do not have one, you can enter your email address and you'll get a link to um, create a free account. And um, from there, follow the steps in order to get 
uh, the Cloud Pack for Data dashboard, create a new project, upload one of our notebooks, and then you'll be ready to run. Um, so let's see. I, I did post this yesterday as well. I'm not sure if anyone has completed those steps prior to joining today. Um, I guess if so, let me ask you once again to, to raise a hand or add a reaction. And um, if there's enough of you that have already done this, we can, we can kind of pull up a notebook and start going through some things. Otherwise, I'll give you some time to complete these getting started steps. We're expecting it to be about 10 to 15 minutes, but might be faster for you if you, if you go quick. Uh, and then Gigi or Nick, anything you want to add? And if not, I'll probably have uh, Alexander open the unmute the participants or allow them to unmute so that they can ask questions or interact with us. I think given the size of the audience, unmuting everyone would be good. Yeah, I think so too. Oh, you know, we should uh, mention that each of the notebook can be run independently, right? They don't necessarily have to run in order. Mm -hmm. So depending on um, your learning interest, um, you can dive into whichever ones that make sense to you first. Uh, Alexander, is yes. the participants able to go off mute? Um, I, I think everybody has to unmute themselves. Okay. I can't unmute everybody at once. That's, that's In fact, fine. We were so, unmuted and can mute ourselves now again ourselves. So all right. yeah, <laughs> we, we now have our free choice. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, we'll leave you be to complete the getting started steps and um, you know, just use the chat or speak up when you've completed that and we'll start going through some notebooks. Hi, sorry. Um, I tried to create the account there, but uh, when I clicked create account, it just says error, you, your account cannot be created at this time. Do you know why that can be? I've seen those when people had various browser extensions. Uh, maybe the easiest solution would be to try either incognito window or just clean up the cookies. Um, I think that that was, I know, um, you know, some of those are closed by some browser extensions that I have installed. Okay, thanks, I'll try that. And Lee, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Yeah, I was just saying, if, if you continue to have trouble, let us know. We can probably find a way to get you a notebook environment. Um, uh, so that you can complete at least notebook one that doesn't require Spark or anything. So even just running a notebook in your laptop would work. Oh, you know what, Lee? That's a good point, right? Um, when you do get into Watson Studio and setting up a project, picking the right cloud environment. Yeah, and that's in the right getting started now. steps. That's in the README. Yeah. yeah.
I uh, I've imported uh, the first notebook and I get the message kernel not found. Uh, can select Python 3.7 with Spark. Is this correct? Um, or without kernel. Uh, mm -hmm. You 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 could select the one that is not. Don't don't click the without kernel. Uh, select the other one and then refresh the page and hopefully it will come come up cleaner. So, so I believe what happened is we use the custom environment to run this. Environment you should be using is the Python 3.7 with Spark and, and you should only have one of those available, only one Python with Spark option. It's easy, actually, if, even if you click and open it in the wrong environment, it's very easy to change. Lee, do you want to show it or I can do it? You, you can show it, that's great. If you open the notebook and the environment is wrong, what you need to do, click on little I thing. And here in an environment, in a Dropbox, just choose one. I believe what you'll need is you will need the default part, Spark 3 in the Python 3.7. So that's the one that would be the most universal for you. If you don't see that one, you can also choose the Spark 2.4 and, and 3.7. Yeah, I feel like in the instructions I, I wrote up, I used Spark 2.4 and Python 3.7. Okay. Yeah, you will not see any difference yes. between those two for the purpose of this meeting. Okay, Lee, I'll let you share again. Sure. Lee, do me a favor. Can mm -hmm. you take uh, Catherine and try a breakout room with her with the screen sharing and help her get through the account creation? Yeah, I could definitely do that. And then someone else can take take the share here. Um, sure. Uh... Now you should be able to see some breakout rooms that you can select yourself. Or I can try to do it myself. I, 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 I see two. There's a room one and a room two. Um, and then you can you can select participate. Uh, can you see this on my screen? I'm, I'm, I do more and then breakout rooms. It pulls up this breakout room page. And so, um, Katrine, if you could join room one. And once I see that you've joined that, I can I can hop over there and Nick, you can take over the main session. Okay, uh, I'm gonna hop over, thanks.
Can I ask the participants just for a quick favor? Can you guys in a chat post where you are? Are you still working on provisioning the service? Are you working on a certain notebook that will help us kind of moderate the session more effectively? Okay, so we got someone who ran the first notebook. Maybe that would be a good time. Maybe if you would like to also share the notebook and go through some of these examples. Cool. Looks like people ran the first notebook. Um, I can open it up. Uh, if you were not in yesterday's session, the first notebook illustrates interaction with a Watson Health Fire server. So essentially, you, you have a number of fire specific queries that you'll be running and looking at operations. Um, it, I can just walk through a couple of those. So the first one is um, just looking at the, you know, what are available capabilities and the supported types. And then uh, there is a different fire search examples that's available. So this one is searching for the patient response and then queries all of the patients and prints the status code and the first 25 lines. And then the further we go, the more uh, meaningful we're gonna get. So maybe we'll just look at some specific queries. So, so parameter types. Um, so this one will search for the patient resource. Uh, it will look for males, females. It will get us a count and uh, the first line of it um, of the gender element. So in, in a nutshell, I think the uh, comments here explain what each of those does and you can just use the notebooks to interact with the fire server in its native parameter. So here I'm showing, uh, we're looking for, you know, querying the patient resource. We're looking for uh, the name um, that contains Smith. So you'll get Smitham, Smith, Heller Smith, et cetera. So it's a uh, contains search on, uh, on a name within a patient resource. If you're looking for exact name, um, you will be using the exact parameter so that will give us all of the Smith and all of the elements in the name as well. So in this case, it's just going to be the Smith without any variations like, you know, Smith. Um. Any questions, comments so far on what we're trying to accomplish in the first notebook? I'm sure people here are somewhat familiar with the fire. APIs and fire queries. So what we're trying to illustrate here is that we are uh, we can run all of the fire native queries directly from the notebook environment without you know needing to go to any different IDE or uh, Postman or anything like this. Questions, comments, anyone? The final piece that we believe is important is being able to bulk export. So the bulk export capability will take whatever, you know, whatever resource we need and either individual resource or all resource and export them all in a bulk fashion in this NDJSON format. And once we export it in NDJSON format and save them somewhere, then we're ready to run the notebook too, which actually is using the native Spark capabilities to interact with them. So let me pause, see if any of that made sense. And if you, if the audience is ready to move to the second notebook. OK, 
Can you help me just posting it in the chat where you stand? Yep, I don't think you need to run the bulk export. It'll take some time. We already have all of the results exported for you and, and ready to go. And we have the user credentials. So if you want to interact with your bulk export, we can dive in right into the notebook too. So everyone is ready for the two? OK, so let's start with the two. So the notebook two is using the native Spark capabilities. And what we do is we are working with those exported results. We provided you with all of the credentials to the cloud object storage. So you can just read the data from the cost buckets. And um, at the very beginning, so the cells three through five, which are setting up the credentials, in cell six, we're setting up some cloud object storage functions that are unique to IBM Cloud. Um, well, if you work with any other clouds, you know, both are three, maybe, you know, it would be, you know, quite similar. Um, and then uh, what we're doing here, starting from eight, is actually we are looking at those exported, bulk exported uh, resources. So we're going to start with a condition resource. And since it's an NDJSON, the format of export from IBM Fire Server is, is just a generic NDJSON, and Spark can read it with a you know, single one-liner. So what we're doing here, we're telling Spark to read the file. Uh, we specify that it's a regular uh, JSON format. We need to specify multi-line equals false because it's a new line-limited JSON. And we're just telling Spark to read uh, the input file from the input bucket. That's it. And so in the first, um, so after we read the condition file, we're doing a bit of a query, right? We're looking at the first couple of records. We're printing the schema of that file. And then we're going through the queries, like identifying specific condition. So looking for clinical status code active, verification status confirmed, uh, looking for the SNOMED code of 44054006 that corresponds to diabetes, and then looking for a specific onset date, which is set to a bit of unrealistic, you know, 120 years ago, just to get everyone. And then uh, we offer you guys three ways to uh, get the output. So the first one, <clears throat> we simply select the variables that we want. And as you can see, the problem with those, they still remain very nested. And the names as displayed are not exactly intuitive. I have three variables named code. Unless I look at the nesting, it's hard to understand what these are. In a second option, uh, we do the renaming of those variables. So we actually use the alias syntax from Spark to give them a more sensible names. So now I have patient condition status, verification status, nomad code, etc. So it actually gives them the names I can recognize. The only problem is I'm still dealing with vectors. And uh, if I were to pass it to more traditional uh, you know, format the data scientists would use, like, you know, pandas, uh, they would actually hard, pandas would have hard times dealing with those um, arrays of vectors. And so the third option is we actually break down <clears throat> those arrays. Uh, we only keep the first element, which, as I've noticed in a fire format, is in 99.9% .9 of the cases, is always this, the case. It's just, you know, the first record. And so this one gives you traditional square data that um, would be, you know, you can put it in Microsoft Excel or in the pandas or anything like this. So these are kind of the three things we wanted to show you and teach you in this session of how you can take um, a variety of uh, fire resources and 
easily using Spark convert them into the format that would be, you know, similar to what every single data scientist would be used to. So I'll give you guys a little bit of time, just try running it, looking at the results. Uh, we'll watch for the questions in chat. We'll watch for the questions uh, online as well. In your experience, what's what is the hardest part in unnesting the the fire structures? Um, so, I I don't believe it's hard to unnest them. To me, the most difficult part was figuring out what is where and why, and, and just going through the data dictionaries and understanding what is in each field, mm. and. Um, unpacking them and figuring out, you know, what values do I need? Because a lot of variables are named the same. Meaning if, if I go back to this example, uh, I mean, I would have dozens of variables whose name is code. And so going through the nested structure of a JSON and figuring out which variable is it and how does it relate to fire resource in a data dictionary was really hard just figuring it out once once it's all figured out it's just a matter of you know typing along you know dot 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 to get something um to and then unpack them into the you know into the flat format so, so that was to me the most difficult one because i had to spend a lot of time studying the data dictionary but it's um uh, i don't think it's it, it's a unique to fire in all fairness data science you know we spent 90 percent plus of our time wrangling with data in any ways and so it's it's just a traditional experience um, so i think that the advantage of fire is at least the values are standardized so once you unpack the full one you know whatever else comes to fire you'll be able to reuse the same piece of code Uh, so I, I wanted to ask every participant to do me a favor and just post in the chat where you are so we better understand whether you're ready to move to the third notebook or not. Uh, I have a question here uh, in notebook two. Like mm -hmm. uh, we are loading all uh, file data from a JSON file, right? If uh, if we don't have a JSON file and suppose it's just a column of strings in another data frame or something, is there a good way to extract that into a data frame, like um, to get the schema? So you only have a flat file? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. Just like, um, um, let's say like just a, a data frame with a column of a string which are uh, boundaries. Um, so, so Lee, I didn't know what the bundles are. I, I would assume that it's just a, if it's just a flat file, then yeah. you, you would read, you know, Spark read CSV. I would imagine that's what you want to do. Yeah, suppose it's CSV or even a text file or something like that. Yeah, well, then the only difference would be I'm, you know, I'm reading Spark I mean, I'm reading JSON files, so I'm specifying the JSON format. If you read the CSV, it's going to be Spark read CSV, you know, Spark read per case, Spark read whatever format is. It, it should be able yeah. to handle it. So, so there is no like Spark read for a fire bundle, but that would actually be kind of interesting. <laughs> um, so currently, you'd have to loop through all the entries in a bundle and, um, uh, you know, get them into basically an array or of some sort or write, you know, convert a collection, a, a, a bundle of type collection into an NDJSON um, to have a one line read into Spark, um, which isn't real difficult, but you know, it is, it would be some work. Okay, thank you.
we have roughly 10 minutes left. So uh, if you want to move over to notebook three, maybe that would be a good time. All right, so GJ, I'll hand it over to you. Sure, let me share my screen. Can you see? Not yet. No. Oh, hold on, let me try again. What about now? No, it's working. All right, awesome. So the notebook three takes the um, parquet file that Nick has prepared, that's stored, um, and build a set of predictive models. Um, the environment setup process is um, identical, so you can go through that quickly. Um, and what we do here is we're taking this NPR, LPR row um, from the cost bucket that was exported in Notebook 2 and then read it into Spark quickly and take a look at it. So you haven't, if you have not finished Notebook 2, it's all right because the file has already been stored for you. You can go ahead and um, grab the file. Um, and then it goes through some um, basic analysis of the data so you can get a sense of where um, the data distribution looks like. Um, if you're interested, you can take a look at the links that I've included here that helps us um, identify which diabetic um, comorbidities to consider and also some common complications that we looked into. So the list here in um, cell 13 um, gave you a sense of the prevalence of the comorbidities that we included in this study. Um, you will notice that you follow a pretty, um, I, I think, reasonable distribution of prevalence. Um, and this specifically, the notebook will focus on how likely the patient will um, acquire new neuropathy um, five years within five years of diabetic onset. So the way to think about it is the patient comes, and we learn that um, the person has diabetes. And we want to get a sense of um, in the near future, five years, if the person will get neuropathy, which is a um, neurological disorder that is um, a common complication from diabetes. Um, there's some work here in um, fixing the date. Um, some, you know, something happened with the date format when we import it into Panda, so we had to do that again. Um, and then we calculate some features. You can see some features about um, how old is the patient at the time of diabetic onset, the onset age. Um, some data evaluation just to see what the distribution looks like. Right? For this instance, uh, most patients were diagnosed with diabetes between the age of 20 and 50. Distribution isn't um, exactly smooth, um, and typically the range is larger, but um, please do keep in mind, um, we, for this um, tutorial, we brought in the data from um, Cynthia which is a synthetically generated data set. So um, things are gonna look a little different than the real world. Um, we also computed features like the year difference, um, when was the comorbidity occur compared to the diabetic onset date. Um, and then you can kind of see a visualization of that for the different comorbidities that we considered. Um, zero is around where my cursor is, meaning that's the, um, the date when that's so the patient um, have diabetic onset. So you can see um, when the comorbidities tend to happen either before or after the diabetic onset. Okay, so that going forward. Um, the next thing is now we got a good handle of the cohort. It seems to have the information that we need to build a predictive model. Um, then we want to hone into a subset of the data um, that will have um, clinical meaning. So a common practice is to define the patient cohort. Um, there's certain inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, a simple one will be, you know, we only want to look at patients who are adults. And some other ones will be, um, you want to be careful about your data ranges. You want to make sure all the patients in your cohort have the fair amount of data before and after the diabetic onset. So you want to get rid of patients who you don't have sufficient information on because otherwise you'll bias your model. So um, here's four examples um, for you to look at. And then um, after you've done the cohort filtering, you will get um, 
um, you go from about 7,400 patients, 7,400 patients to about 6,800 patients. So the filtering criteria is not very straight and um, we still have quite a few patients left. And I get asked often, um, how many patients do you need to build a model? It really depends on your data um, characteristics. Um, typically, several thousand is the minimal. I, you know, in most real world data, especially in EHR, we have to be looking at uh, a couple hundred thousand to get some level of um, um, signal in the data. Um, sometimes even more, it needs to be closer to half a million or a million, but it really depends right on the data characteristics and the problem you're trying to solve. In this case, um, um, the data is behaving pretty well. Um, so now we're pretty happy with the cohort size. The next thing you do in this session in under self um, 24 is um, what we call pivoting the data, right? We transpose the data so that each record is a patient and you have all the information about a patient in the columns. So it's nice and neat, nice, you know, rectangular file. Um, you see a lot of um, um, no data here. It's because the patient um, does not have um, any of these conditions doing now within our data set. So it's a very sparse data set. Um, if this data was um, really big millions, um, then we will likely um, pick a different way of organizing the data. So we don't um, end up with such a sparse large data. Um, we can look at each um, feature as a vector of its own and feed it into the model instead. But, but given that it's less than 7,000, I think we are right here with pandas. Um, then we want to be really clear on what is our input and what is our output. So we spend some time setting up which is our target. Right? As a reminder, we're looking at a patient who has gotten neuropathy. So that's our target. That's demographic features, which we will use as input predict predictors and also conditions. Then we do some um, encoding um, so that um, a feature is one if it's a condition that the patient has prior to or on the diabetic onset, otherwise it's zero because we only want, we are in a way pretending that we go back in time at diabetic onset if we know these things about the patient. So we have to be careful in how we handle the feature um, construction. So for interest of time, let me just um, hop forward. Some of these, um, most of these, um, each cell should take you know, less than a second to run. There's a few of them that take 10, 15 seconds. Um, so as you get there, um, the, the core part is the model development piece. And um, I encourage you to step through it at your own time. Um, first and foremost, right, we always want to split our data into training and set, test set. Um, in some cases, we will do even three sets, right? Train, test, and validation, depending on how complex your modeling um, approaches, um, if you're doing cross validation or not. In this case, we're keeping it simple, just two sets, train and test. Um, and then with that in mind, then we wanna focus on building our predictive models using only the training data and setting the test data aside so we can use it to perform a um, unbiased evaluation of how well the model is doing. We don't wanna mix the data that we use to train the model and um, show the performance results. Um, and then 5.2 um, is where, you know, we want to just do a univariate analysis, just understanding the relationship of a feature to the predictor. So one feature at a time. And uh, this is a simple chi-square um, statistical test to see if um, it's significant. Um, most, many of the features are not significant on its own with the exception of, in this case, um, we're not, um, Rentalophy, and then also how many comorbidities the patients have had at the time of um, diabetic onset. Seems like you know only a handful of features are significant on its own. Um, so what we want to do in the modeling is to look at a combination of them to get a sense of if um, we get some signals by combining the features together. Um, having the handle, oh, let me make a quick comment. In traditional statistical analysis, you, you know, a lot of our statisticians will recommend not including any feature unless it has a pretty low p-value. Um, in this case, um, the machine learning models that we picked, um, actually all of the ones I have in here, have a um, built-in regularization uh, method that will do the feature selection for you. So you don't have to do it manually. Um, you could just pull it in and make sure that you pick the right software and most of them has a pretty good um, feature selection ability, which lets you go from in this case 24 features to a subset of features that are truly meaningful without worrying about um, collinearity and stuff like that. 
um, a quick example here, the logistic regression. Um, you run the model by using this package called logistic regression from scikit-learn. And um, you can quickly look at the accuracy of the training and test set. It's very high. We have a really good performing model, which is a little strange um, to, to, be, to be honest. Um, we did double check on what's going on behind the scene. Um, but one thing I do want to highlight is um, the um, accuracy from the tra training set and the test set are both pretty high. That means we didn't overfit. You know, it's what we've done in training set, it's been able to um, uphold itself in the test set which is good news. Um, because logistic regression is a linear model, it's easy to interpret its output. So you will see in this notebook, there's some examples on, you know, some common things that people would do to take a look at feature importance and so on. In this case, you know, I generated a feature importance table for you to get a sense. Out of the 24 features that we fed into the model, um, the engine picked 16, and here's the list of descending order of features of importance. Um, and then another classic um, classification model, right? Here we're saying, hey, would the patient get neuropathy within five years of diabetic onset? So would the patient get it? Um, this is a classic way to take a look at the prediction results compared to the grand truth, um, which is the actual. Um, you could see in this specific example, most patients do not get neuropathy um, even five years of diabetic onset. And um, the model does a pretty good job. It does a, a um, everyone who would not get it, they classify as a person would not get it. Um, for the patients who do end up getting it, in this case, it's a little over 100 patients. Um, it does a reasonable job picking up, you know, about 80% of them so that you can indicate. So that's very not zero um, false um, negative rate and a, a small sense of um, a, a small number of, of um, I'm sorry, false, small number of false negative um, and no um, false positive. Whew. Anyhow, um, I included some of the classic performance metrics that folks look at, precision recall, if you live in the statistical world or if you talk to a machine learning specialist, um, the phrase are typically used as sensitivity and specificity. Um, it's just different ways of looking at the performance. Anyway, for interest of time, I'm going to pause. You can play with the different um, modeling methods. In this case, the tree model does the best, probably because it mimic well with the how the, gen the data was generated in the first place. Um, but that's yes. it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, and we are unfortunately out of time. If you have any other questions, please use the Hoover uh, question and answer section. So. Um, we can get back to you uh, after the presentation. And again, uh, thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of Dev Days. Thank you.